Here at GCN, we really do love a bit of retro tech, and we know you do too. So we thought we'd share with you some of our favourite bits of old school tech. Starting with these Spinergy Revex wheels. Now the company was set up in the early 1990s by a former Cannondale engineer called Ralph Schlanger. And with their distinctive striking design, they certainly cut a dash in the peloton. I like what you did there, Matt. That's right. They were distinctive, certainly. I mean, eight carbon spokes essentially bonded together. You could also stiffen them up with some little Revex inserts in you, there as well. You could indeed, and they really had, a, as well as a distinctive design, a distinctive sound as well. They certainly did. Oh. A little bit like a helicopter, really, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> now, aside from ourselves, because both John and I did ride these quite amazing wheels in the 1990s, uh, that is actually a picture of John in his back garden. Uh, despite the pixels, he is there somewhere. This is retro after yeah. all. Now, lots of other top pros used them, didn't they? Mario yeah. Cipollini when he was riding for Seiko. Paolo Bettini rode them as well, as well as Michele Bartoli. Oh. But, what a legendary rider he was. Yeah. But, as the 90s progressed, there are increasing stories of these wheels quite literally exploding underneath the riders, as well as other stories of them causing quite nasty and gruesome injuries as well. Yeah, let's face it, Matt. Essentially, they were eight blades of carbon flapping around in the peloton, weren't they? Indeed, like lawnmowers almost. <laughs> That's right. So in the end, in 2001, the UCI took it upon themselves to ban them. Ban them in competition. And then the Spinergy Revexes were essentially sent to the carbon scrap heap in the sky. Tell you what, despite the risk of them sort of at any moment exploding underneath you, they're still one of the coolest wheels ever, aren't they? Yeah, I'm absolutely gutted I sold mine. <laughs> Power pedals, the pedals that make you a winner. Or, well, that's what it says on the box. Wow, anyway. what a tagline. Now, these retro pedaling tech actually date back to 1995. He used them and came from Norway. What was most interesting about these was the fact there was a clutch mechanism inside of the spindle, making it impossible to backpedal, which in theory, anyway, created more leverage by adding the length of the shoe sole to the length of the crank arm during the upstroke phase of the pedal stroke. Wow, that was really well explained, John. Well, actually, back in 1999, I had to use these very pedals, this actual pair, in fact, because the team that I was riding for was sponsored by Power Pedals, therefore there was an obligation for me to do so. And I must admit, it took me about a month to get used to them, especially the sketchy feeling in races where you just couldn't pedal backwards. But the other big factor in terms of performance was the weight of these, because they are very, very hefty indeed. I'll tell you what, Matt. I've brought in some scales. Let's compare them to a modern day equivalent. Let's do it. Right then, John, I'm looking forward to what these, should we weigh the modern pedals first as a bit of a benchmark? Yeah, let's yeah. do them first. So they're full carbon Dura-Ace pedals, aren't they? Yeah. So there's a pair of those. Let's have a look what they're weighing at. So, 235 grams. For the pair, okay. Let's put the little power pedals on. Well, not the little power, but they're big, aren't they? Yeah. They are pretty hefty. They're actually quite small, the platform, aren't they? But yeah. the the axle's pretty... Well, <laughs> it's not looking good, John. No, I must admit, not. I've nearly broken the scales. Uh, well, 446 grams. Yeah. Yeah, that's nearly over half the weight of some modern frames. Yeah, that's... Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. No. Did you find any efficiency gains when you were using these? Well, despite their heft and their weight, I actually did. Um, I definitely felt a difference when using a larger gear. And I felt, especially up long drags and shallow kind of climbs, using a big gear, I felt like I was recruiting all the muscle groups and there was no dead spot at all. So mm. I obviously wasn't be able to quantify it. I couldn't quantify it at all because we weren't using power meters back then. But there was definitely something in there in that the dead spot to me was eliminated. So there's definitely something there. Yeah. They kind of just disappeared though, didn't they? In the, like the, the late 90s, where yeah. they just went into obscurity. I mean, perhaps the, the hefty weight of them outweighed the performance gains, who knows? Yeah, um, I understand though, they have actually been reinvented in recent years. There's a slightly snor smaller and lighter clutch mechanism, but still, they do remain very niche. <laughs> Next up, John, we have these. In the flesh. You mean the aluminium, right? Yeah, all right. Anyway, these, in my opinion, these Scott drop-in handlebars are arguably, actually not arguably, they are the most iconic handlebar of the last 30, 40, or even 50 years. Even, well, nearly as iconic as the guy that bought them to fame, really, Greg LeMond. He of two World Road titles and, of course, three times a Tour de France winner. But more importantly, 
a tech trailblazer. Yeah, he sure was, Matt. These bars were actually made by Scott, who at the time were a ski company. And in, back in 1990 was the first time we saw them. And the aforementioned Greg LeMond went on to pilot the Easter victory in the Tour de France that year. Um, they allowed the rider simply to get aero, low and narrow. Just like that. Like this? Yeah. I mean, I've pretty much got Greg's position. You've nailed right, yeah. the aero there. I mean, interestingly, although they were as iconic as they were, there's only a few other professional riders that went on to use them. One of whom was the famous Russian TT specialist, Vyacheslav Ekimov. But what he did, he took it a step further. He added some tri bars that were attached to the bottom of the bars to end up in the position just like this, which was, I must admit, pretty sketchy. And it was unsurprising, really, that towards the back end of the 1990s, these bars kind of fell out of favour and the Indra didn't really see them at all in the Pro Bowl song. Yeah, it's a shame, really. Some of my earliest memories were seeing Greg LeMond, you know, this, this trailblazer, like you say, and he had them, and it was really cool. I mean, I remember buying some and being so chuffed to put them on. Interestingly, though, Matt, still race legal, still use them. That's nuts, isn't it? Yeah. So do you fancy coming out of retirement and sticking these on your bike down the local crit at Bristol? I, I tell you what, you give them a go first of all on some descents just to make sure they're stiff enough still because they've been in the loft for a few years and we'll, we'll go from there. Now these ill-fated aero extensions had quite a short shelf life didn't they? And they had quite a divided opinion as well with riders, both aesthetically as well as on safety grounds. Yeah, there were Spinacci bars, and they're actually developed and produced by Italian manufacturer Cinelli between 1993 and 1997. At the end of the 1997 season, after being used for years by many, many professionals, they were banned on safety grounds. But what they allowed the rider to do, as John is demonstrating now, is to get into an aero, elongated position on the bike. And they could actually be adjusted, just here, into a different variety of positions, depending on the size of the rider. It's hard to imagine these days that they were actually allowed in bunch races, weren't they? I know. I mean, you get back into the aero position, no wonder they were banned. Look how far away you were from the brakes. Now, one thing about these bars was that they were ultra fast, weren't they? Pros, amateurs all over the world at the time adopted these and they were using them. Rumour has it, although you can confirm, Matt Stevens here actually took five minutes off of his PB riding 40k to work. I certainly did for exactly the same effort. They were super aero, but also very, very comfortable as well. Comfortable and aerodynamic, what more can you want? But the interesting thing for me uh, is the pros of today, who basically, we see them trying to get in an aero position, don't we, draping their forearms over the handlebars. And surely, actually having something to support you, like the Cinelli Spinaches, uh, was more safe. I mean, at least it's kind of food for thought. Now imagine this, Matt. Yeah. Scott Droppins, Cinelli Spinacci combo. That is a dream. It is the ultimate retro aero combination. I tell you what, I'm all over it. Yeah, I, th I think I'm going to take these out for a spin actually later. Well, on. no, because I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of ride home on these tonight, John, to be honest with you, mate. Oh, please. It's all right. All right. Well, I guess you'll get home five minutes quicker anyway, yeah. won't you? <laughs> please. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed our trip down the memory lane of tech, but we would love to know what your favourite bits of old school tech are. You know what to do? Leave your comments down below. Do make sure that also you like and share this video with your friends and to subscribe to Global Cycling Network, click on the globe, which is somewhere on screen right now, to see Matt ride the triple crown winning bike of Stephen Roach from 1987, click just down here. That was a lot of fun. And to see Simon and me battle it out on the floor on the cobbles of West Flanders on a retro bike belonging to Johan Museo, no less, click just down here.